Welcome back. In the previous segment, we have reviewed how the practice of licensing or registering journalists violate international standards on freedom of expression. In this segment, we're going to focus on the um, protection of sources, a key principle at the heart of the practice of journalism and one that is protected by international standard. Protection of sources basically means that journalists have the right to maintain and guarantee the confidentiality of their sources. The rationale is simple. While known and quoted sources are always better for the purpose of transparent reporting, there are circumstances when sources may prefer to remain anonymous. They may need to protect themselves against retaliation, in, of any kind that may even include killings for passing on sensitive information, for instance. In those conditions, journalists should have the right, in theory, to keep their sources confidential. They should not be asked to divulgate their names to anyone, including a court or the police or their friends um, or, or the public. On the other hand, it has been argued including by the police or the court, that they may require access to the identity of the source and to the source, either for the purpose of interviewing them, since they may have been the, the witness of a crime, or in the worst case scenario, for the purpose of charging them with a crime, which may include divulgating sensitive information. But, I mean, they, the court or the police may need to access the source for a a very large number of reasons. Should the journalist be entitled to keep his or her source confidential? That's a very important question and one that has been the object of much uh, court uh, decisions and, and arguings and it's um, an issue for which courts may not always argue. In 1996, the European Court established, at least as far as Europe is concerned, the principle of protection of sources in a seminal case called Goodwin versus United Kingdom, when it found that a request for disclosure of um, a, a confidential source in a journalistic context was an impermissible violation of Article 10 injunctions to prevent the publication of the information could be considered necessary in a democratic society, but disclosure of the source of said information was unnecessary. What is the case about? The applicant was a trainee journalist with The Engineer magazine who received confidential information regarding the financial state of a company, Tetra Incorporated. The source provided the information through telephone and wished to remain anonymous. The information itself was unsolicited and was not given in exchange for any payment. It was provided on an unattributable basis. The information itself appeared to come from a confidential corporate plan, one copy of which had gone missing, it later transpired. On the 22nd of November 1989, the Justice Hoffman ordered the applicant to disclose, the applicant meaning the, the, the newspaper, the engineer, to disclose by 3 p.m. his notes on the ground that it was necessary in the interest of justice within the meaning of section 10 of the 1981 Act. There, basically, the, uh, the judge ruled that the source identity had to be disclosed in order to enable Tetra, the company, to bring procedures against the source to recover the, govern, the, the document um, which had gone uh, missing and the document at the heart of the disclosure. The journalist appealed unsuccessfully to the Court of Appeal and the House of Lords. He refused to disclose his source and he was fined 5,000 pounds for contempt of court. Ultimately, he went to the European Court and complained of a violation of Article 10 of the Convention. And the European Court had thus the opportunity to, to rule on a very important issue and to deliver its, um, its seminal 
decision, one that has been enforced almost systematically since then. I'm, I'm going to quote uh, from the, the European Court here. It stated, protection of journalistic sources is one of the basic conditions for press freedom, as is reflected in the laws and the professional code of conduct in a number of member states, and is affirmed in several international instruments on journalist freedom. Without such protections, sources may be deterred from assisting the press in informing the public on matters of public interest. As a result, the vital public watchdog role of the press may be undermined and the ability of the press to provide accurate and reliable information may be adversely affected. Having regard to the importance of the protection of journalistic sources for press freedom in a democratic society and the potentially chilling effect an order of source disclosure has on the exercise of that freedom, such a measure cannot be compatible with Article 10 of the Convention. The court concluded that there was no reasonable relationship of proportionality between the legitimate aim pursued by the disclosure order in the British court and the means deployed to achieve that aim. The restriction which the disclosure order entailed on the applicant's exercise of his freedom of expression cannot therefore be regarded as having been necessary in a democratic society. And as I have mentioned, the European Court has been pretty much uh, systematic in um, following this uh, decision in protecting protection of sources, at least in the European uh, context. Additionally, 90 countries have specific provisions for the protection of sources protection in their national laws. So altogether, I think those numbers demonstrate that for uh, many countries around the world, the protection of the sources is uh, a key principle at the heart of press freedom and freedom of expression. Indeed, that principle has been um, highlighted by international uh, jurisprudence. But interestingly enough, there is at least one country where uh, that protection is not uh, enshrined and is not recognized as such, and that's the United States, which has a far more ambiguous and complex approach to the question of protection of sources. And I'm going to highlight it because uh, it is uh, an important uh, position that the United States hold on that matter. Protection of sources here in the United States is not recognized as a First Amendment right. Although individual uh, states uh, can offer their own version of protection of sources. So what this means is that at federal level, there is no protection of sources. Although at state level, some states have recognized, in fact, the majority of the states have recognized the protection of sources. The US Supreme Court was invited to consider whether journalists had a right to confidentiality of sources in the case of Brunsberg versus ICE. Uh, and it also had, had uh, other opportunities uh, after that one. So let, let's look at this case and at the decision. Paul Brunsberg was a staff reporter for the Louisville, Kentucky Courier Journal. In 1969, he published an article which documented two young men producing hashish from marijuana. The, the article stated that Brunsberg had promised his sources that he would not provide their identity. However, Brunsberg was then later subpoenaed by a court to provide testimony regarding the incident. He refused to identify the individual, but the trial court uh, denied his contention that under both Kentucky and constitutional law, there is a reporter's privilege to keep the sources confidential. On appeal, the Kentucky Court of Appeal denied again Brunsberg's petition. Brunsberg then filed 
with and before the US Supreme Court. He argued that without the ability to maintain the confidentiality of sources, journalists would lose their sources, thus providing less information to the public. Well, maybe strangely enough, the US Supreme Court rejected this contention. In a somewhat, in my view, rambling fashion, the court compared journalists to average citizen and determined that if a citizen isn't able to claim testimonial privilege and instead is forced to disclose their observations of criminal activities, then so is a journalist. The court also believed that the press had flourished without the privilege of sources confidentiality and therefore that there was no uh, ground to believe that without protection of sources there will be no press freedom. The court however indicated that states were free to establish what is referred to as reporters privilege laws. The, the use of the term privilege is um, very revealing of the way the United States is considering and looking at uh, confidentiality of sources. It's really seen as a privilege of journalists, while in other parts of the world, it's seen as enshrining the right of the journalistic profession. So what happened after that decision? Well, uh, there is no federal level law that protect protection of sources or privilege of the reporters, but there are many laws at state level, they are called shield laws, and they are in place in some 40 states in the United States. So the vast majority of states in the US have adopted those shield laws, in effect, protecting journalist protection of sources. The absence of a federal right to protection uh, of sources has been challenged on several occasions, but the original position of the Supreme Court basically never, never changed. The US Congress sought to adopt a bill which will grant confidentiality of sources, but the pro process failed on a number of occasions over such issues as the definition of who is a journalist, meaning who could claim this right of a protection of forces, and it also failed on the exception to um, the protection of sources, particularly on national security issue. And so it is that in the United States, which for many people around the world is um, symbolizing freedom of expression and press freedom, journalists do end up in prison for refusing to uh, put forward their sources on so-called contempt of court charges. For instance, Judith Miller of the New York Times was jailed for 85 days in 2005 for refusing to disclose her sources in a government probe into a CIA leak. Another New York Times journalist, much more recently, James Risen, fought a 10-year legal battle to protect his sources. He lost each of his appeal, including at Supreme Court level. But ultimately, in October 2014, the then Attorney General Eric Holder stated that no reporters is gonna go to jail as long as I am Attorney General. So James Reason escaped uh, the, the prison sentence, but it remains that he could not uh, call on a reporter's privilege to protect his, his sources. To end this segment, let me highlight a case from Norway which demonstrates that courts, even in situation of national security, can uphold freedom of expression and the protection of, um, of sources. It, it's actually a very important case, uh, particularly given the international context, and I will have the opportunity to return to that, to that case. It concerns a filmmaker called Rolfsen, who is working on a documentary about the Islamic group, the, the ISIS group. And he is following the activities of a Norwegian uh, group, Norwegian individuals, who uh, may be on the way 
to join ISIS in, in Turkey. He's particularly focusing on the leader of that Norwegian group called Ubedullah Hussein. He's a Robson cameraman filmed how Hussein was driving a 18-year-old Norwegian to the airport in Gothenburg, Sweden in the spring of 2014 to catch a flight bound for Greece. Both Hussein, who had openly supported extremist terrorist group, and the 18-year-old were under police surveillance. The police believed Hussein was recruiting the teenager for terrorist activities. Swedish police, in cooperation with the Norwegian police, stopped the 18-year-old at the gate and he was charged on suspicion of intending to join IS or ISIS in Syria. Hussein, the leader of that uh, group in Norway, was charged with recruiting him in addition to charges he already faced for allegedly making threats and encouraging acts of terrorism. So far, I think, so good. Uh, nobody will object, probably, to, uh, to the intervention by the police. However, the Norwegian police also took advantage of, um, of this arrest to seize the documentary makers' films, all of which were unpublished, in order to use those films as evidence in the case they wanted to bring against the 18-year-old and against the uh, leader of the Norwegian group, Hussein. The case eventually goes through various layers and reach the, um, the Supreme Court of Norway. And what did the, the court uh, decide? It highlighted or relied on the following element, and I'm going to present them to you. The first issue is not necessarily whether the seized material identify a source when the search warrant is widely construed so as to potentially expose sources. So here the court is insisting on the concept and nature of trust. Even if a source is not named in these films that have been seized, the mere fact that those films could be seized could undermine the trust relationship between the filmmaker and his sources and could have, of course, ripple effect outside that particular case. Um, if there are any suspicion a source could be exposed, that suspicion will be enough to undermine the, um, the, the ability of the journalist or of the documentary maker to, to proceed with his or her activities. Second, the court said that protection of journalistic privilege under Article 10, meaning the protection of sources, extend to unpublished materials. Remember, the film had not been seen by anybody. These, are, these were raw footage. Even if it does not identify a specific source, that too, while not a novel position, is an important one. Even if the material is never used for any publication purposes, even if the unpublished materials do not mention a source, the material should be protected along with the potential sources. Again, because of the centrality of trust. Thirdly, the court recognized that freedom of expression is not absolute and can be restricted in the name of national security. However, it finds that the, the project by this documentary maker, Mr. Rolfson, addresses a pressing social issue where the public, as well as the government, has a particular need for knowledge and insight. The investigative journalism was made possible by way of the trust that Mr. Rolfson enjoyed in an otherwise closed Islamist environment. Effective source protection was decisive for the realization of this documentary. The court also said, and that I think is very important, that the police had a number of other investigation methods available in cases such as this one, 
meaning it did not need to rely on the film for its evidence. It needed to do its work as a police and find other sources and other forms of evidence. The previous court, the Court of Appeal, which had ruled in favor of the police, itself had been in doubt as to whether the protection of sources should be waived. In the Supreme Court opinion, this doubt should have been to the benefit of the protection of sources. And I quote here, serious doubt must result in not being made subject to a duty to testify rather than the opposite. So this um, is a very important decision on the part of the Norwegian uh, Supreme Court in a context where courts around the world, it must be said, have always tended to side on, um, on the same side as the police or the, the security officials. Very importantly, in that particular case, the protection of sources was identified as central to building trust and central to the ability of the journalist to report on an issue of great public interest. And frankly, said the court, the police need to do its work and needs to find evidence without resorting to the journalist um, sources and to, in this case, his films. So I will end this segment here with the, um, the contention that protection of sources has actually become an international norm, a norm of protection for journalists and indeed for the right to freedom of expression gl uh, globally, the, the right of the public to access information that may be sensitive in nature, that may uh, be focusing on the activities of government, on the activities of the powerful, on activities of the mafia or indeed on terrorist groups. This right can only be achieved if the sources uh, anonymity may be protected and thus it is why protection of sources by many court around the world and observers of freedom of expression and freedom of uh, the press is considered as fundamental to the reality and the realization of the right to freedom of expression. Thank you very much.